My name is Jaken. Uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to, to, to. I'm going to talk together with uh, Sanita and Lau, which, we, which are here making strange uh, things. And we are editors of Italian Wikipedia. And uh, this was the homepage of Italian Wikipedia on October the fourth of uh, 2011. The website was not uh, accessible. You could only see this page. And uh, why? Uh, it, why? Uh, in this presentation, we'd like to recap some information about the Italian Wikipedia strike, or blackout as you prefer, of October 2011. So we will explain you why and uh, what. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, during the government of Mr. Berlusconi, a bill was introduced uh, to limit the wiretapping activity of uh, the judicial authority. The wiretapping bill was first introduced uh, to the parliament by the Minister of Justice, Angelino Alfano, in 2008. This fact in itself uh, doesn't really interest us uh, as Wikipedians. It may interest us as individuals, but uh, as Wikipedians we might have to be neutral, so we have not been interested in that. Unfortunately, uh, in, in Italy it's quite normal that a bill contain norms that have nothing to do with the main purpose of the bill itself. And um, so so there is this norm that you can see here, I, I'll, uh, I'll read it. For internet websites, including, including newspapers and magazines distributed by e electronic means, statements or collection are published within 48 hours from the request with the same design characteristics, the same methodology of site access, and visibility of the same news which they relate. So, this norm came to be known as uh, a matza blog, which means uh, blog killer. Um, okay. Uh, okay, um, this norm is in fact an extension of the diritto di rettifica, which means uh, right to correction, that uh, you that uh, existed uh, has existed in Italy for a long time, and what is this? Uh, according to Italian law, newspapers are obliged to publish statements to publish statements or so-called correction of people who affirm they have been damaged uh, by by the newspaper itself. The funny thing uh, is that uh, the newspaper have to do it. Uh, even if, they even if the newspaper claim that the correction, the correction is not in fact correct. So it's not really a correction. And there is another funny thing uh, that the bill would have done. Uh, the correction would have uh, to be published without any comment. So I cannot even say that, hey, this correction I am obliged to publish is not correct. That is, uh, at present, the newspaper will always do that. I mean, uh, you have the politician that say, ah, oh, you said that it is false, you said something about me that is very, very false, and they say, no, it's true, I have the, pr I have the proof, and it, will then, it will, wouldn't uh, be possible anymore with um, this norm. The newspaper have uh, two days' time to do that. Uh, we may criticize the norm. Uh, I personally do it, uh, but at least uh, it is arguable that the newspaper have the resources to deal with it uh, because they have a paid staff and editorial staff. Uh, but then, uh, there, then uh, it, there is the new thing. Uh, let's go back to the text okay, of the paragraph. Uh, the bill would have extended the, the rule to internet sites. Uh, which internet sites? They wrote, including newspaper and magazines in distributed by electronic means. This means that uh, uh, this include uh, uh, website uh, news uh, news uh, sites, but it includes basic basically every website. So it will uh, apply also to blog, and uh, hence the name Amazza Blog Blog Killer. And here we are. It will. Why shouldn't it be apply okay, applicable to Wikipedia? So to us. So, what's the problem with, the, with this? Uh, Sanita will go on and explain. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm about to talk. I'm Sanita, another administrator of the Italian Wikipedia version. And we're talking about the issues, the issues that would have, uh, you know, uh, affected our version in case the, the bill was passed. First of all, technical problems. Because the requested uh, correction, as Jacken said, uh, should be uh, is de uh, was deemed to be non-modifiable, 
and should, uh, should have been posted without any comments. So that means that we have to, um, to assure that that correction would have not been edited by anyone. But how can you do it? I mean, we cannot just block one statement because the, lie uh, say, uh, because the law says this. So we would have blocked the whole article. And you know what that means in terms of modifiability and accessibility and, and so on. And then there is another problem. It's not practical. We have no editorial staff. We are not newspapers. We are not magazines. We are a, a free encyclopedia with voluntary contributors. So who would be responsible for A, collecting the requests, B, checking the identity of, of the applicants? Because, of course, we had a lots, lots of problems with, with trolls sometimes. So how can I be sure that the applicant is really the person who is affected by this uh, defamatory statement? And C, who would be responsible for modifying and then protecting the articles within 48 hours? And that's another thing that we, uh, we also wanted to, to stress. Uh, we initially, when we initially discussed about it, we said, okay, we have OTRS, so we should you know, demand this to OTRS. And I am an OTRS member, and you may easily understand that we don't know, we do not want such a responsibility because we are voluntary contributors too. So there is absolutely impossible. It's absolutely impossible to practically implement this law. And then the neutrality problem: any correction would not be neutral because we would have a statement like uh, Mr. Someone. Uh, stole uh, uh, some some boxes in in a shop, and then we would have with the same uh, you know with the same wiki markup, the, an, a statement of this person saying no, I never stole any box in that shop. Uh, it was a, a, a conspiracy by the judges because we we all know that they are leftists or something like this, and we should have keep that uh, that statement without any modification, without any comment and exposing ourselves also to other potential li uh, liabilities from the judges themselves who have been defamated. And of course, this, uh, this kind of statement would be completely unsourced because ma uh, mainly we receive some, uh, uh, through OTRS, we also receive mails about people um, complaining about things that really happen in, in, uh, in real life and we have sources about this and there are newspapers and there are magazines, and they say, no, it's not true. So <laughs> we would have like the opinion of who is uh, mm, defamated and not the truth, and not, uh, not the truth. So just let us make a, uh, a little step back and re uh, let's reconstruct what happened. In June 2008, the, uh, the Justice Minister, Angelino Alfano, presented the bill in the parliament. So after two years of discussion in, the, in both the, um, the chambers of the parliament, uh, they were near to the, to the final uh, um, passing of the bill. And that's when Wikimedia Italy first came out with a statement uh, declaring all the possible risks for, uh, for Wikipedia, the same risk that I just explained. Then in September 2011, we passed a horrible summer uh, dealing with crisis, the, with the economic crisis, and then that's the, that's the real problem in Italy, the wiretapping. So the government wanted to restart the discussion, Not, uh, we were <laughs> really in the middle of the, of the hurricane of the economic crisis, but now justice is the main problem. So they, they restarted the discussion about the bills, and in early October 2011, when uh, uh, the bill was was threatened to be uh, definitely passed in commission on in the, at the chamber, uh, we started a discussion. So mainly we said, okay, we should do something. And then in uh, kind of two or three days of really uh, of a real uh, <laughs> great discussion at the, uh, the village bump, we decided to do something really, you know, great without uh, and, and do it abruptly. So that's why we came out with the idea from October the 4th to October the 6th to block out completely Wikipedia. 
to blacking out, uh, to blacking it out. Why? Because uh, we didn't inform the OME, uh, well, we informed the Wikimedia, the Wikimedia Foundation and also Wikimedia Italy, but that's, no, that will be uh, Laurentius' part of the speech. But uh, the, the thing that we, um, that we wanted to do is that was something completely abruptly and something that, uh, that could be just come out of the blue and say, and not just because we wanted to take a partisan, you know, uh, we, we, we wouldn't like to, to, to appear as partisans in that. We just wanted to stress out that our rights as voluntary contributors were threatened by a law uh, written in, so in a really poorly manner. So that's why we decided to act. And about the, uh, the reaction, I just leave the floor to uh, Lorenzo for the, la for the third and last part. Thank you. Well, uh, I want to remark that uh, this was uh, a de um, decision uh, made uh, only by, mainly by the community of Italian Wikipedia. Uh, the Wikimedia Foundation was of course uh, informed uh, about uh, this uh, idea. Uh, they were uh, supporting uh, us against uh, the, propose the proposed bill, but uh, there were so of course uh, some doubts uh, about uh, the um, whether it was useful or not uh, to make uh, the strike and the blackout. Um, however, uh, they decided uh, to let us uh, do it. In uh, regarding um, Wikimedia Italia, <laughs> il, um, also Wikimedia Italia was not involved uh, in the decision. That was uh, uh, um, decided uh, both by the Italian, commu Italian Wikipedia community and uh, by uh, Wikimedia Italia. So I wanted to make clear that uh, it was, uh, uh, there was a distinction between uh, the two positions. But uh, of course, uh, when uh, the, the press uh, say saw the, um, the blackout, uh, they called uh, Wikimedia Italia because uh, they knew the phone number of Wikimedia Italia and of uh, Frida mainly. <laughs> So we had uh, to manage uh, most of the, uh, of the communication with the press and that was uh, really a lot of work. Well, that uh, is what uh, we did uh, and uh, it seems that uh, it worked. We had uh, interesting consequences, uh, first of all. Uh, the statement uh, was uh, seen by a lot of uh, people, uh, about uh, 20 million of uh, views uh, of the page. Uh, as a comparison, uh, not that uh, uh, in Italy there are about uh, 60, th 60 uh, million of people, so 20 million uh, views is uh, really a lot. We have, uh, uh, there were um, a lot of uh, un unofficial um, groups and pages on Facebook. The most important of them, the biggest one, was called uh, Salviamo Wikipedia, uh, Sa Save Wikipedia, and uh, it reached uh, over 200,000 uh, uh, fans uh, in a matter of hours, and it, it uh, still has uh, many, many fans. And uh, of course, uh, we had uh, a lot of press coverage. It's, uh, the number of articles on Italian press uh, is uh, too high to be counted, uh, and I don't have uh, uh, any reasonable number, but it was uh, really a lot. And uh, we have also a lot of coverage from international uh, press. Uh, we've counted uh, more than uh, 30 uh, countries where the newspapers talked about us. Well, of course, uh, the most important thing is uh, what happened uh, in the parliament, what happened to the law. Il, uh, we were, um, during that uh, strike and shortly after, we were contacted by a few politicians, uh, not so much, but uh, a few contacted us. And, and uh, there were uh, many public statements uh, of politicians uh, against the law and supporting uh, uh, Wikipedia. Also from uh, the same party of uh, the government uh, and the same party who proposed the law. 
and uh, of course uh, the most important thing uh, the law was stopped um, well uh, it was uh, delayed but uh, it's um, this is uh, mainly technical uh, it was uh, we can uh, say it was stopped one thing we can uh, measure uh, on what we have uh, exact figures uh, is uh, the fundraising. It's not, uh, of course, we don't uh, do a blackout uh, with uh, in view what happens in the fundraising, uh, but uh, it's interesting because uh, we say some, uh, something uh, with precise numbers. And we can see that uh, in, t in uh, the last fundraising, uh, there was uh, a, a huge increase uh, in uh, donations and in number of donors uh, in Italy. It was uh, uh, about a uh, hundred and eighty percent increase in the number of donors uh, from the pre previous year, <laughs> and uh, also compared with the uh, overall uh, global uh, growth uh, of uh, donations to Micromedia Foundation, we had about 65, 68 percent uh, in, in um, <coughs> increase uh, in the number of donors, uh, which is uh, really a lot. This was, uh, in my view, because. Uh, having uh, a blackout uh, made people uh, realize that uh, Wikipedia needs not to be always there, it may not uh, last, uh, and uh, when uh, we, sh we, can we may have to do something uh, to, to protect uh, uh, it. Like uh, in when uh, in the fundraising it was, co it was asked to support uh, its existence. Well, it was uh, a success, uh, but of course uh, we made some errors. Uh, it was uh, unavoidable because it was the first time. Uh, it was uh, we didn't have uh, so much time uh, to uh, develop the implementation of uh, of the blackout. The first uh, error uh, is in my opinion, in my opinion, uh, the timing. It is uh, a simple problem, uh, but uh, it has. Uh, a uh, real effect. Uh, we um, the blackout started at eight the blackout started at 8 p.m. and uh, it is uh, it is it was uh, too late uh, both for the uh, evening uh, news and uh, for uh, the day after uh, newspapers. Feedback. Uh, initially, we didn't have uh, we blocked uh, the whole Wikipedia, so it wasn't possible to give a feedback. Later, we unblocked some pages uh, on, uh, and people was able to write on it. Facebook, uh, we have uh, some, um, uh, some uh, fan pages, uh, but they were all unofficial. In, uh, now, the biggest of them uh, is, uh, use still exists uh, and uh, is using uh, uh, the page to promote uh, something completely different uh, from uh, uh, Wikipedia. And, uh, we, if uh, we had uh, created an official web page, we would uh, have uh, been able uh, to control it uh, and to avoid uh, this, uh, this type uh, of, uh, of use, of misuse, of exploitation. But uh, in my view, the biggest mistake uh, is that, uh, well, if uh, in the future uh, we will have uh, uh, another problem like this, uh, and uh, I'm not so optimistic, uh, it will happen. We will have to start from scratch again, uh, while uh, we should uh, have uh, tried to develop uh, a software way to, um, to raise awareness uh, about uh, problems regarding the existence of Wikipedia. My first thought, uh, the maybe the simplest thing, uh, is uh, trying uh, to um, ask the people uh, who see the statement uh, to uh, give an email, uh, an email contact, uh, create a mailing list uh, and use, uh, use it uh, to send them uh, information uh, in case uh, of other problems. It will be very useful because in this way you can uh, um, write to people wi which is uh, interested to it, uh, which has explicitly uh, asked for it uh, and without uh, uh, modifying uh, the um, acting uh, on uh, the, uh, the Wikimedia project. However, this was uh, the, the 
it's the first uh, time we tried something like this. I hope it will not. Uh, we will not have uh, many similar uh, examples in the future, but uh, <laughs> well, it's uh, as a first uh, first case. It was uh, quite a success. So if if you have any questions, you don't yes, sure. I have a quick question. I'm, s I'm curious that. Oh, okay. Is there a microphone? Yeah, yeah. probably. Is, you know. Is there? Oh yeah. It's ah okay. Perfect. I'm surprised this is the law for your newspapers. Even it sounds like such a horrible idea. And I was just curious: are your newspapers overrun with these statements? Like. How can anything function, not even just websites, but how can your print and journals work? Uh, well, uh, newspapers um, uh, usually put it uh, where there are also letters. And uh, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if they, maybe they don't publish all of them and then they go to the lawyer. I, 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 don't, I don't know, but um, yeah, th I mean, the, the, the main difference here yeah, is that uh, newspapers uh, uh, have a big staff. And anyway, uh, please notice that uh, now, now, at present, they can comment. So I mean, uh, I mean uh, probably not so many people send uh, letters to say, yeah, this is not true, if they know that, ju that journalists can say, no, it's true, I have the proof. So m probably there, there are not too many. In fact, right now we have, you know, the, the possibility for someone to reply, but the journalist would reply to the to to the to, to the applicant. With this law, they were cutting out the possibility to reply to the applicant, and more. Uh, and a newspaper usually does the the right of correction in, you know, page forty or something. That would have been uh, discriminatory to websites because we, uh, the blogs and, of course, Wikipedia should have uh, put this clarification inside the text, not in a separate box or something. While the, the newspaper would have been allowed to to put it where they want it. So that's that's not another thing. I mean, other questions. Um, what Hi. gave you the idea of this protest? And is this protest, this boycott, link with the um, uh, Sopa and Pipa uh, recent? N absolutely not. Uh, it, it's uh, OK. Uh, just figure this. Um, I, I talked about the economic crisis in, in summer. Uh, we, we just went out. Uh, it was a burnout reaction. <laughs> That's it. We were, like, for since four years in, in, the, um, in the spotlight because of our economic situation. And we were all, all, of, uh, all of us, were, we were all the Italians, quite all of us, were really mad at our, uh, at our government because they didn't took any measure needed to, to solve the situation. And then, out of the blue, they restart once again with something n completely not related to the economic issue. Okay, and this time, for us, for, for us Wikipedians, that would have been the, the total uh, mass suicide Digital suicide, of course. So th this time we really feared and we reacted in some way. We just had some, okay, we just have to do something. And then someone came out with the idea of blacking, it, uh, blacking out the, 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 the Italian version. But then we were like, okay, but probably we're doing uh, this protest, but no one will follow us. Really, we were really thinking about it. I mean, no, the newspaper will not care about it. No, they will just... Blacking out, uh, blacking us out, and when we saw like seven thousand people on Facebook liking the Save Wikipedia page in like three hours from the starting of the blackout, I mean, oh my God, what we did! <laughs> I mean, it's com it was completely impossible. And then in uh, three four hours, all the w Italian websites and of course newspapers uh, talked about it, and then we also made it to do the BBC, to the CNN, to the Washington Post, to you know whichever newspaper in the world you may think. So, I mean, it's, uh, th that's how it started, out of the blue. And that's why we made all these mistakes. No contacts, uh, blocking out the whole Wikipedia, because we came out in, uh, really, in four days with this idea. Yeah. I just, uh, yeah, I just, just like to say that there is a sort of a link with the later initiative of the English Wikipedia, because uh, these uh, strikes have done as an example. 
if you read what uh, the, the shoe gardener for example and cat wash uh, wrote uh, at the, they were support they were supportive of us and we were really really happy of this but they were not so sure of uh, the, the idea of a strike of a blackout uh, but uh, after a few months they did a blackout so i mean uh, may maybe really we we, we served on a, as an example of what uh, we could have done because it worked but they announced it <laughs> they announced it uh, at least is there any time for any nope so okay we're done Hey there. So I'm James Forrester, and this is Philippe Vaudette, and we're going to talk about lobbying and how it's not entirely evil and something that's only done by money-grubbing people on K Street. And so um, we've illustrated it with a picture of the Capitol because that seems appropriate given where we are. So who we are and why you should listen to us. Um, so I'm James Forrester. I currently work for the Wikimedia Foundation, although both of us are speaking purely in personal capacities. I'm formerly six years as a UK government civil servant working in central government on a number of policy areas. And uh, I got lobbied quite a bit. Either my ministers or me personally or my senior uh, bosses got lobbied. Uh, so I'm quite familiar with what lobbying actually looks like from the receiving end. And um, there were quite a lot of people that lobbied me. Very few of them would share goals, I would say, that this crowd would have. And, you know, so if I'm only getting lobbied by the one set of guys, you know, guess what? So I'm Philippe Baudet. Uh, I also work for the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I, I was formerly a paid political staffer. Uh, I worked to help get candidates elected. Um, and I was, in fact, on the opposite side of the lobbying. I was the one who lobbied people. Um, I was a lobbyist uh, working on... Uh, issues that were relevant to social change organizations, which is my polite way of saying that I was on the, um, the losing side of many issues in conservative Oklahoma in the middle of the United States. Um, I had nothing to offer. I could only say thank you. That was uh, all I had to offer. So uh, I got very creative. So the word lobbying is um, interesting because a lot of people think of lobbying as uh, K Street and that's slang, political slang for this, which is lobbying for legislation. We want a new law. We want it should be illegal to do X, or it must be legal to do Y. Or, you know, it's okay for other people to have it illegal, but it should be okay for us. You know, it shouldn't be illegal for us, or something like that. Or you should scrap this existing law. Or, you know, we want you, the legislator, to change how things are. This is incredibly expensive in terms of political capital. You have to convince not just one uh, person, but you have to convince at least half the legislature. It's a long-term process. It takes a lot of time, a lot of money. And of course, it fails a lot, especially if you've got an opposition. And you can have unintended consequences. You can go, oh, now it's unfortunately legal to do something that we thought was quite good. There's also lobbying the executive. So when people were lobbying me, I was a civil servant, I was in the executive, they were actually um, trying to get a change in how processes happened. So, you know, changes in action or, you know, maybe not enforce the rules as they're written quite so tough or in quite that direction. Um, cultural shifts as well, encouraging the, uh, the uh, executive to bring forward new powers. And it can be relatively easy it's very visible you know you get a nice picture of the prime minister or the president or whatever you know smiling and shaking hands with jimmy wales but of course it's that person and if they move on then you don't have that uh, long-term ownership of the uh, change position then there's judicial stuff now this is crazy expensive um so this is a picture of the european court of human rights um where you can overturn things like it's illegal to uh, um block uh, voters even if they're in jail in Europe now. Um, that's quite interesting. Uh, that's not our area, but um, that took, I think, something like 10 years to take forward. We're talking about lawyers are paid thousands of euros a day for 10 years, and they won. Well, one side won, the other side lost. They also spent, you know, 10 years paying tens of thousands of euros. So it's very expensive, it's very risky. You can end up with a judgment that's much worse than the status quo and um, it takes forever. Then 
there's the other kind of lobbying, and this is what I think we really want to do if we're talking about lobbying. Lobbying the public, i.e. getting people to agree that what we're doing is the right kind of stuff and the other people are the bad guys. Because it turns out the public, they lobby themselves too, although they call it voting normally. Um, they can have huge knock-on effects in how uh, politicians change things, whether they're in the legislative or the executive. Um, you can uh, get them to say, hey, you know, we want free images in your area. You should write to your local library, your local legislator, and that kind of thing. That can have some serious effect. And of course, it's much more our style. It's slower, but it's grassroots, it's, you know, gradual, and it generally ends up being a kind of tsunami wave that washes away all other opposition. That's the upbeat way of saying it. <laughs> so, strategy. So, uh, when, you're, uh, when you're lobbying, one of the things that you have to define is what is it that we'd like to do? What is the change we'd like to see? And there are a number of different things that, that we, uh, we identified here. These are all things that we think are important or that could be lobbied for. Uh, and and you, know, you know, you can take a second and look at them there. Now, you probably don't want to try and go in and talk to anybody about all of those things at one time. That would be a, a bad idea because they'd go into overload. Um, so, you know, you might want to identify one or two things that are important to you, that are most important, and I, I think you'll probably know when the time comes because it will be something that threatens your ability to create content, for instance, or threatens your ability to get rid of bad contributors. Uh, so, the, the Wikimedia movement has actually engaged in some of this in the past, obviously. So, what we've done, um, tactics, uh, small-scale involvement with executive branches, large-scale protests named at, uh, aimed at public or legislators, and we've listed a few of the high-profile ones there, um, and the occasional amicus brief uh, for legal cases where we have an interest in the result. I think, Jeff, you're here. We've done one amicus brief at this point, or? Yes. Yeah, yeah one. one. Yep. Uh, so has it been successful? Um, maybe. We've got some great examples, you know, the glam sector, uh, joint events, things like that. Those uh, relate to the small-scale involvement. Um, the, uh, the issue with large-scale protests is that it's significant investment of social capital. Uh, it has definitely seemed to work for, for the English Wikipedia, the Italian Wiki. Um, the jury's still out on Russian because it's still very much an active issue right now. Uh, so we're not, gonna, we're not gonna make a call on that. Um, and uh, the amicus brief, yes and no, and it's got potential, uh, but we're not totally focused on this. It's pretty costly, it's very time consuming. And we don't have a whole lot of lawyers. Uh, on, uh, we've got, you know, I think they're all in this room at the moment. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, yeah, they're they're very closely making sure I don't commit them to anything. By the way, I'm not above it. <laughs> so, a couple of things that you need to be aware of: um, any and all lobbying activity can have implications for the movement. This is, uh, you know, I work in the legal department, so this is the the time when I talk in scary lawyer voice. Uh, the legal issues here aren't simple. You probably cannot just read a little bit of, an, of a Wikipedia article and understand the legal implications of this stuff. Um, the, the foundation particularly is restricted as to how much it can engage in lobbying. Uh, you could be accidentally putting the foundation or the projects in jeopardy. Please, please, please run potential activity in this area by us um, because among other things, there may be somebody already working on it that you're just not aware of, and we can connect you and uh, you know, help you out some on that. Um, so there we are. So this is where I put a start of a 10 down on the ground, and then we're going to open it up. Um, I have three very high-level principles. We should do our lobbying in public if it's possible. For each issue, we should you know, have a plan <laughs> and <laughs> maybe we should prioritize those plans so these are more important than those ones and we should work on these first. So three little things against that. Some lobbying doesn't work if you do it in public. You know, if there's a public consultation and you respond publicly on day one, the opposition, who might be a large company based in Washington, say, will write a very detailed rebuttal of every single point you've made. You've already done your lobbying, it's too late. They've taken your very helpfully posted online comments and um, destroyed your argument and you've now lost. And it's over, oh I'm sorry, you want to go again? Sorry, it doesn't work like that. So 
in those cases, you'd want to publish it after it's too late for the opposition to react. But obviously, engaging the community as much as possible, which comes to my next point. And finally, if we're going to prioritize, we kind of need to understand what it is that we're prioritizing against. So a prioritized list of movement objectives. Priority one, issues that are critical to running the sites. You know, what we do right now. Priority two, things that affect not us, but our readers, our reusers, our community. And then finally, other stuff that we'd kind of like to see happen. So as an example, and people will shoot these examples down, so please don't pick at them. Priority one, library protection for Wikimedia Foundation and things like that. IP waivers, patents for software, you know, that could be problematic. Level two, scope, reforms of IP, things like that. And finally, you know, internet access as a human right. That sounds cool, that sounds excellent. That's not as important to us, the Wikimedia Foundation, the Wikimedia movement, necessarily, as being around next year to keep fighting for it. So, what actions could we take? What actions could we take? We, uh, there are a number of different things we could do. For instance, the foundation or the projects could sign on to publicly endorse a project. If, um, uh, if your local NGO is working on something important, you know, that's one option we could do. Another would be um, the use of the brand, uh, the Wikipedia logos to support a project. That's slightly higher level of engagement. Um, you're going to want to run that through the foundation, of course. Um, we could use the sites to make a point. We've done that in the past, the blackout. I, um, I would encourage us to do that as rarely as possible because I think it um, loses, it diminishes value the more we do it, but it is an option. Um, we could partner with other organizations to help create a movement. Um, so if we and the EFF and Creative Commons all get together and do something, all of a sudden it's a bigger movement. Or we could provide monetary support in some cases. If, um, if there's somebody who's doing great lobbying work and they just don't have any money to continue it, that's something that, that possibly we as a movement could help with. So um, yes, Mr. Forrester, let's get to work. Yeah. So uh, this is the bit where we cheat and we ask you <laughs> to supply the content for the rest of our talk. As in, what is it you'd like to see happen with lobbying? Do you think this is a stupid plan? Is this something you'd like to see happen? And um, we'd love to hear from you. Comments? Yes, there's one down there. Do we have somebody with a mic? OK, we have somebody with a mic. Yes. Okay, so we had um, some right here. Yes. No, no, I don't uh, have a question. Uh, okay. Uh, so my, I was asking several years ago the Wikimedia Foundation people uh, if, uh, about uh, doing something uh, on international level. I mean, in for example, UNESCO public domain discussion group, uh, then to screen what WIPO is doing uh, and what kind of new treaties or new. Uh, f points in all the treaties they would like to apply and uh, <coughs> it uh, will never happen and it's not uh, the, the thing to do by the community but rather by a s probably selected employees rather to be watch what's going on in WIPO or UNESCO and then if, uh, simply to join the discussion groups and at least give the voice so for example as I know Russians started to do something like this through their government and uh, they were talking I in, in Poland and in last Wikimania as I remember about this without any, uh, uh, any effect in fact. Sergey Russia Wikimedia. Mm. The projects like Wikipedia, uh, Wikisource, Wikiteka, is not belongs directly to the some kind of branch like New York Wikimedia or Washington Wikimedia, etc. So how to solve questions? Can one district, uh, one branch of Wikimedia represent some any project? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a that's an important question, and um, it's one that I think is 
is not easily answered. Um, and I think it's something that we as a, as a, a movement are going to have to confront. James, you have thoughts? So SOPA was a sucky law. It was a really sucky law. It was going to screw over all the Wikimedia projects because we're hosted in the US. So we blacked out the English Wikipedia, but not the other ones. And we blacked it out globally, even though the people inconvenienced in England and in South Africa and in Australia and in hundreds of other countries who use English Wikipedia aren't affected. Was that the right thing to do? Maybe. But, you know, actually having a discussion about, you know, how do we impact, you know, when we're doing public lobbying or direct lobbying, who are we going after and what's effective and what's appropriate? That's a really serious conversation. I agree we need to have it. I don't think there's an easy answer. Yeah, does Wikimedia New York get to speak for Wikimedians in the US because they're one of the two bodies who are here? Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Does um, Wikimedia Italia get to speak for every Italian speaking Wikimedian in the world just because almost all of them either are in Italy or love Italy? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, you know, that's not to say Wikimedia Italia are wrong to be proactive and it's, you know, it's wonderful to have engaged community and that's what we want to encourage. But where do you say actually this goes a bit too far and where do you say no that's appropriate? And how do you get everyone to be happy with it before you do it and then, uh, you know, getting Wikimedia community to be happy after the fact, which is maybe harder. Next question. Hi, John Davis from Wikimedia UK. Um, it seems to me that we do need you guys in the center to be keeping an eye on what's going on because some of the forces of repression will be looking at opportunities internationally to pick us off one by one. Like a ripple. Hey, I, I, I can think of another area that I know very, very well and that it's an international industry that looks for weak spots to put legislation or to influence legislation in countries one by one. Um, to try and get a, a domino effect. And it seems to me that uh, we have to be looking at the issues globally to make sure that we're not being picked off one by one, which isn't very helpful, but it means that you guys have got a very strong job to do. So one of the beautiful things about the Wikimedia movement is that um, while, while John positions it there as it's something for us to be watching, I actually think it's more something that the community is, is better equipped and better positioned to watch. I know we're all worried about our own local issues as well, but but we together as a group are much more powerful than and have many more eyes than I do um, or anybody in our organization does. So I think it's, it's important that, that we watch out for each other, um, that we uh, help to grow and nurture systems that allow us to, to do that caretaking for everyone else. But I think it's a mistake to depend on the foundation to do it because I don't have a whole lot of time. There's also the problem which is um, do we just lobby in the places where we happen to have people on the ground, even if that's not the best place? So how many people do we have who are in Geneva and able to lobby at the WIPO in Geneva? We have Wikimedia Switzerland who are great. How good is their, is their lobbying potential and are they happy to be focused on Geneva or do they want to be domestic or, you know, regional or, you know, other things? And are we you know, expecting people to get up to the plate to, you know, the whole movement is counting on you to fight the good fight in Geneva. You happen to be there, so good luck. You know, that's not very fair to Wikimedia Switzerland. It's not necessarily very appropriate. They may not be wanting to do that. They may not be good at doing that. You know, and that's not to say they're bad. Um, I haven't asked. Uh, and just because, you know, um, we have generally uh, a lot of people in the places which affect us doesn't mean we don't have no one at all in the country that we care about a lot. Um, a really obvious example, we don't have a chapter in the People's Republic of China. That at the national level, you know, and mega superpower level, are doing serious things that we care about, like blocking Wikipedia. They're not blocking Wikipedia this week, and hopefully they'll not be blocking Wikipedia next week. But if they did, who goes to talk to the People's Republic of China? Actually, is it appropriate for, to ask people in China who can be arrested and executed in, by the Chinese government to risk their own lives to open up Wikipedia even more than they already do? 
maybe the Amnesty International uh, approach, which is where you only lobby a country you're not based in, could be something we'd like to look at. But then people who don't live in the People's Republic of China might be not very interesting to be uh, as the uh, rec receivers um, of this lobbying will say, well, you're not one of my citizens. Why should I care what you say? So there's, this is not a solution. <laughs> this is not even the start of a solution. It's the start of a question, which is, how is it that we might move forward to somewhere where we're sort of happy with the lobbying concept? Um, and I wish I had an answer. Um, Jimmy Wales were saying this morning uh, that Wikipedia should be kept uh, not with this word, no, like cold brain with issues that people go passionate. And I would like to ask if it's different things, Wikipedia, than uh, Wikimedia. And uh, during the last year, uh, 2011, there were a uh, big uh, social shaking in many parts of the world. And uh, there were uh, uh, networking uh, between s several uh, regions of the world and also inside regions. And uh, my question is uh, how far could be a synergical thing since all these questions are framed on a huge, uh, bigger political frame? That's a nice small question there. Um, <laughs> so to kind of dissect the question into a few different bits, um, there's an interesting question about priorities within our own movement. Is that if there's something that's absolutely critical to the existence of Wiktionary, and there's something that's a minor irritation to the French Wikipedia, which one do we prioritize first? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry for the wrong. Sorry. Bonnet moi. Um, or what about Wikiversity, Wiki species? Tell me when I've got to the point where we don't care anymore. Or do we care about all of them? What about the projects that aren't ours but are kind of like ours? What about OpenStreetMap? What if it was suddenly illegal to show a map in some country? You know, we'd probably care about that. You know, how do we say, well, they're sort of nearly the same as us? Or is it the, you're in the club with the Wikimedia tattooed onto your heart and you're us, one of us forever, or tough, we don't care. Uh, you know, we could say that. Um, that's probably a fair thing to do, given that donors give money to Wikipedia, Wikimedia, Wiktionary. They don't give money to OpenStreetMap. And, well, generally, if they do, it doesn't end up in our bank accounts. Um, but then there's the other question, which is how do you um, separate uh, items that are to do with one country. So ACTA was a, was, is, who knows, a global agreement, or at least affected most of the WTO members, so we're talking 150 countries. Multi yeah, it's multi-jurisdictional, and it got killed, sort of, by the European Parliament. Who knew that the European Parliament was the best place to lobby against ACTA. Anybody got that? One guy, two guys, excellent. We've got some psychics in the room. Um, yeah, so this is something that needs to be ratified at a lower level. So, you know, the UK Parliament could have rejected it even if the European Parliament had passed it. So maybe we could have lobbied at the European level or the UK level, or maybe we could have lobbied the WTO directly or the United States Congress. There are about a thousand different venues for that. How do you pick the right one? Because if we spread ourselves as a thin veneer across all of them, we'll achieve nothing. And we'll probably achieve nothing on a lot of the lobbying we'll want to do when we go really hard at it in one very specific point. When there are lots of places to go, how do you make that call? Do you just say, well, we've got three volunteers in Geneva, one volunteer in London, turns out it's gonna be Geneva. What if that was the wrong call? And how do we live with ourselves if we made a mistake? 
you know, how do we not just turn around and, you know, scream at each other and say, it's all your fault for picking Geneva, it should have been London. Who knows? And that, that's hard, says I again. Sorry. Oh, we've got a couple of questions. There. Hello, Joseph Regal. So this, your conundrum reminds me of my time when I was the policy analyst for the World Wide Web Consortium in the 90s. And I was curious about your term at the lobbying because in the United States it has a particular technical and legal definition. And for instance, at the W3C, they do international web standards, and it's really a fictitious organization. It's this contract between hosts in France, United States, and Japan. So there's a lot of similar issues with respect to internationalism and legal status and consensus. But I was never a lobbyist. I was never registered as a lobbyist. Um, one of the ways we conceived of what we did is, if you asked us, we could tell you what we thought the uh, outcome of the proposed legislation or judicial decision would be. So that helped us be sort of very careful in that we weren't necessarily out there as an advocate, um, but that if you pass this law, we think it's going to break the Wikimedia sites in this particular way, and it's a bad thing, and even we'll even prototype that wreckage for you by, for instance, blocking out a site. So I just want to say there's probably more ways to think about this than just lobbying, in quotes. I actually think um, that's that's a really strong and powerful point. Um, when we when we put the word lobbying on there, there, uh, I think both of us stopped and, and thought about it for a second and decided that um, to use that word particularly because it is the bad word. It's it's the one that people are scared of. Um, but I think that what what you position there um, is is a healthy, good way to think about the sort of activism that that we'd like to do. Um, so whether you call it lobbying or you call it social change or um, uh, help us imagine a world in which this bill um, succeeds, however you, however you care to frame it, um, I think um, the point remains and, and I think you're right. Uh, that's, that's a good way to handle it. But specifically, we use the, the L word because it was the L word. Uh, a bill takes a long time to become a law. At what point do you start freaking out? Um, I will only speak to the UK. We've passed emergency legislation in half an hour. So it doesn't take that long. You start freaking out immediately. Yeah, so that's the thing. It can take a really long time, um, especially some jurisdictions. It can take, you know, years, and that's deliberately built into the process. Other jurisdictions, less so. Um, and, you know, I literally have seen legislation go from not existing to being on the statute books in under an hour in the UK, including royal assent. And let's, let's also bear in mind that we're not just talking about bills becoming laws, because the other things to, have to, to keep in mind are things like court decisions or executive orders or, um, you know, mayoral decrees or, or whatever other vehicle there is to, to create a binding precedent that um, will be enforceable by the government. So, yes. Uh, it could take a while for a bill to become a law, could take years, but the president, for instance, here could sign an executive order pretty quickly. So um, I, would, I would stand next to James and say, freak out immediately. <laughs> freak out as quickly as you can and begin to build uh, support and your, your movement for change. Um, just as a really quick example of that, I worked in the UK government on openness and transparency. Um, 12 days into t uh, David Cameron being Prime Minister of the UK, he wrote an executive order equivalent, um, ordering openness and publicity for government data. Um, this was great for me, because this was my policy and I was very happy he had written the letter I had wanted. Um, companies that build the government an awful lot of money and were hidden by contracts that said you weren't allowed to tell this were somewhat upset that their contracts had been overridden by the Prime Minister's pen. Their lobbyists had a bad day. They found out about it when it was published in the front page of the Times. You know, uh, they had no idea it was coming. I mean, they should have read the manifesto, but they had no idea it was coming. Um, it was a bad day for them. It was a good day for me. I counted it as a win. But we, ha you know, it's very easy to get caught unawares, and then you have to know whether you're reacting or whether you just take it as a loss and move on. Loads. Um, A little comment about the last question. Russia, from the first reading of the law uh, and the second reading and the third reading, uh, it was five days. Two of the, them was holidays. It's <laughs> not a lot of time to organize a social movement. Mm -hmm. 
I don't actually know enough about this, but maybe you guys could fill me in. Um, Wikimedia is a 5013C, is that correct? Right. Is your, are you concerned that you're doing too much lobbying and you're gonna lose that? We have a very good lawyer who keeps us safe. <laughs> who might be your boss. Who is my boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, obviously this is an issue, and it's not just an issue in the in the U.S. It's uh, wherever we have organisations, or where we don't have organisations, but uh, citizens acting in a in a coordinated manner is deemed to be of the nature of an organisation can also be prohibited. So you speak to someone down a bar, it's bad. That can be an awful awful difficulty. Sorry. Uh, if I could just make the point that that's the very good lawyer. Uh, I. What we just recently did is we did a what's called a Section H um, election, which allows us to spend up to a very well-defined amount of money. Uh, and it's, it, the, big, the big theme here is it puts us in a better position on the lobbying issue for a nonprofit. But one thing people need to keep in mind, especially chapters in other countries, is that there are also anti-lobbying laws uh, for nonprofits in those countries, but they're necessarily different from U.S. laws. And so you need to be uh, sensitive to that, and as well as to whatever your local limitations are in your own country as a chapter. So that's my only call out. I just wanted to go back to Joe's point, actually, because if the session is really about hearing from the audience about what they think um, would be useful yeah. in building on that, I, th I think that's a great idea. Um, it would be really useful, actually, to think more about that because, um, I mean, I've spent enough time in Geneva and to to realize exactly what you guys are saying, that it's really, really difficult work and, and there's just, you don't really know where you're going to be and you spread really thin. Um, but what would be really interesting is to go back and, and look at something like Sopa Pippa and say, why was it successful? I mean, there were inc incredibly, there were key ingredients in that that made use of what Wikipedia does really well. And, you know, as Joe was saying, it's about, um, I mean, we did something really technical as well. And we did something that most lobbyists can't do. And I think really focusing on that, that, and it's actually very limited in lots of ways, which is great. But going back to that and saying, okay, what is it that we can do really well um, and in this limited way that we couldn't do if we were doing lobbying in the traditional way? Yeah, I think that's, that's critical. And one of the things that we uh, did sort of in a halfway manner immediately after the SOPA blackout was an attempt at a post-mortem to identify that sort of thing. We didn't do it very well. We should really do it again. Um, and uh, Risker was, um, was uh, you know, breathing down my neck to do a better job at it, and she was quite right. Um, so I think that's, that's really important. That's a good thing. Um, unfortunately, I think I was getting a time signal as well. Yeah, so um, can I encourage us to do that perhaps on the wiki, um, sort of a New concept, but we'll try it out, see how it works. Um, uh, and I think that's important. Um, so I'm going to, when I get back to my hotel tonight, start to think through how do we structure some sort of postmortem about that. That's powerful. Uh, so thank you. thank you. We appreciate your engagement.